Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a, a very good evening and a very warm welcome to Professor Andrew Kirkman's inaugural lecture. It's a particular pleasure this evening uh, to welcome uh, Andrew's mother, uh, Iris, who is with us this evening, and Andrew's wife, uh, Amy. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, there was a University Open Forum uh, last week, and one of the questions I was asked was, uh, by chance that we are a very successful university, but are we still a scholarly community? Um, to which my answer was that we were a successful university precisely because we were uh, a scholarly community. Um, and one of the occasions where we exemplify uh, being a scholarly community is precisely these sorts of occasions uh, where distinguished colleagues deliver their inaugural uh, lectures. So it's been important to the history of the university for a long time, and they remain, I think, as important now as they were uh, since our foundation. Um, uh, Andrew and I have something in common. Uh, we both started playing the violin at a relatively early age. Um, here I think the similarity ends. Um, <laughs> Andrew was good enough uh, to become a freshman musician and I was good enough to become a historian. <laughs> uh, if you were to speak to Andrew about his early years and how uh, that passion for music uh, was nurtured. Uh, he'd tell you that he was a relative latecomer to music and that unlike many of his musical peers, he didn't start playing the violin uh, while uh, he was still uh, aged and single figures. Um, indeed, his passions were first ignited at about the age of 11 when he borrowed a recording from his grandmother of Tchaikovsky horses. He says he was mesmerized and so began his love of music. It's therefore no surprise that uh, Andrew went on to pursue his interest in music through university life, during which he was a student at the University of Durham, at King's College London, and at Princeton uh, in the US. And it was in his uh, advanced musical studies at university that Andrew uh, developed an interest in the sacred music uh, of the Renaissance, um, uh, uh, an interest which began perhaps when he was studying a levels but was nurtured and deepened during his university career. <clears throat> Since then, Andrew's gone on to an enormously distinguished uh, academic uh, career. Uh, he's been on the staff of the University of Manchester, the University of Wales, uh, and the University of Oxford. Uh, and immediately before joining us here at Birmingham, uh, he was uh, on the staff of Rutgers University uh, in the US. Andrew joined uh, the University of Birmingham in 2011 as the patent from Barbara. Uh, Peyton Barber, Professor of Music and Head of the Department of Music. Andrew's main research interest has been the sacred music of the 15th century and its dissemination across Europe. His earlier publications were principally as issues of style and influence, though more recently Andrew has been much more concerned with the historiography and the cultural context of music. And uh, the uh, subject of the mass from the 14th to the early 16th century uh, was the focus of his most recent book, The Cultural Life of the Early Polyphonic Mass, published by Cambridge University Press in 2010. Since joining <coughs> Birmingham, Andrew has taught courses uh, on music in the Renaissance, music in the 1960s, and indeed on other subjects. He conducts concerts with the university orchestras, uh, and the Birmingham University Singers, and he tries to maintain, unlike me, uh, his proficiency as a violinist. I think all of you will also know that Andrew has another reputation, an international reputation, both as a conductor and as a performer. And in 1995, uh, uh, Andrew founded the Renaissance Vocal uh, Group, uh, the Binchoir Consort, uh, for a performance of Dufay's Mass for St. Anthony. Hyperion Records subsequently engaged him, and the Binchois Consort has uh, gone on to uh, record uh, um, a, a number of uh, CDs uh, for uh, Hyperion, uh, as well as performing uh, with them across uh, Europe and the US. And his recordings have garnered many prizes from the European uh, music industry, as well as uh, receiving. Uh, enthusiastic reviews um, in both the national press and the specialist uh, music uh, press. 
And it's, it's that fusion of Andrew's interest and in uh, distinction as a performer and uh, his distinction as a scholar of music which gives uh, his work its particular authority and resonance. So I, like you, am enormously looking forward to uh, Andrew's inaugural lecture um, entitled The Life and Afterlife of Early Musics. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sure. Thank you very much, David. Well, I'm aware that inaugural lectures are typically occasions to introduce, or even to give a synopsis of, a new or newish professor's research. In my case, that could mean I'd be treating you to a 50 to 60 minute monologue on music's role in late medieval piety, or maybe a detailed analysis of Cantus Firmus practice in a series of late 15th century masses. What I'm actually going to do is something rather different from that, though it certainly touches on both those things. A great attraction for me, uh, research into music history, as opposed to some other kind of history, is the opportunity that it's given me to invoke aspects of history that I've focused on in sonic reality, to resurrect that history, however partially, from the closed confines of the past, and to allow it to sound again for today's ears. In many cases, that's concerned me with a repertory that essentially died with the cultures whose needs it expressed, and very often with music that's never been heard since. Actually, that's given me plenty of scope the proportion of Western art music that's still regularly heard is really a tiny fraction of what survives. And the reasons for the currency of what is regularly heard today can have to do with lots of contingencies that have to do with things going far beyond notions of intrinsic quality. Music can fall foul of prevailing ideologies or simply lack sufficiently powerful advocacy. It can drop off the public radar by having fallen out of step with prevailing fashion or listening habits, or it may never have been fashionable to begin with. Of course, the reverse can also be true. Music can employ, can enjoy substantial posthumous revival or rediscovery, as in the case of the output of a provincial German composer called Johann Sebastian Bach, or like the Mahler symphonies, which still with a living memory could be greeted by orchestral musicians with derision. Even among composers now firmly ensconced in the canon, there are plenty of dark corners. The operas of Haydn, to give one striking example that I've dabbled with myself. Some music, some composers, and some genres within the works of some composers have just not made the transition to modern tastes as successfully as others. Of course, such value judgments aren't immutable. Our presence tonight, in a hall that witnessed only some half a century ago, pioneering revivals of handle operas that are now familiar across the world is sufficient to remind us of that. There seems little doubt that the, that, that particular sea change owed a fair bit to change it in approaches to performance. Handel's music has responded better to the lighter touch of historically informed performance than, than it did to prevailing operatic norms. And similar shifts can produce dividends elsewhere, and we'll touch later on another example precisely of that. That's not to make any grandiose claims about being able fully to recreate an authentic style of performance, but it's nonetheless true that using period instruments can open one's ears to textual possibilities that just aren't available on modern instruments that may in turn awaken us to compositional insights that might otherwise have remained unavailable to us. Well, there's no doubt that, generally speaking, some of the largest swathes of unfamiliar territory remain in the music of the pre-Baroque era, with, generally speaking, things getting murkier the further back in time one travels. It's here that the torchlight of post-enlightenment revival of music from the Western cultural past has had the toughest time penetrating, and it's also where the ground has most obviously shifted over the past two or three decades. Even when I started studying late medieval music, which clearly wasn't that long ago, <laughs> performance inroads into it were modest, and the sounds produced frequently, frequently gave, to me as any rate, rather little by way of sensual pleasure. It was almost as if at least some performers had taken to heart the sophistry and crabbiness 
perceived in it by the musicological pioneers of the previous century. An important motivator for getting me onto performing and recording this stuff was my own research interest. I wanted to experience the music in sound and, in contrast to some of what I was hearing, in a way that seemed, at least to me, to have some musical conviction. I vividly remember the impact of a performance that I put on in London in about 1984 of Ockham's Miser de Plus en Plus, at that time, I think probably the first modern performance of a piece that a quick search on Amazon the other day turned up no fewer than five CD recordings of. Times have certainly changed. But even today, it's not unusual, at least in the abstract, for late medieval music to get a pretty frosty response. And that's probably nowhere truer than in the case of the isorhythmic motet. Even for a listening public that completely accepts 18th century dance forms and sonata structure without question, pieces built on repeated statements of a borrowed tenor suffer suspicions of arbitrariness and mere formula. No doubt, no doubt that's partly due to the very word isorhythm itself, invented by those same 19th century scholars who struggled to find sensual beauty in the pieces it engendered. But in the hands of a master craftsman, the repetitions of isolated can be the key to structures imbued with elegance and poise, or, as in the case of the first piece I'm going to play you, real power and drive. While I don't want to get lost in technicalities, the trick lies in the manipulation of the rhythmic and melodic repetitions, which frequently accelerate under the aegis of a pattern of repetition involving progressively shorter note patterns. Like so many other motets of the time, the fabulous Incomprehensibilia Fiume, which I recorded with my group, the Bajra Consort, in 2000, survives in a state of anonymity. But a number of us strongly suspect that the hand here of Antoine Bumar, the brilliant and wayward chapel musician of the Duke Charles the Bold of Burgundy. There are such striking resemblances to pieces firmly ascribed to Bumar that it's difficult to imagine it coming from anybody else. In its extraordinary control of musical architecture, relentless forward drive, and brilliantly glittering surface, incomprehensibly stands as one of the most impressive musical edifices of its age. Coming from a time when composers' voices were marked more than anything, at least by modern standards, by stylistic consistency, a piece such as this strikes a pose of such striking originality, an individual, individuality and also self-confidence, but it seems almost to belong to another age. Holding the vast musical juggernaut together is the borrowed structural plain song, divided into three sections that form the armatures, respectively, of the three sections of the motet. Each section begins with reduced voices, with a different voice stating the plain song, each time before it's taken over in a fully scored passages by the customary tenor voice. Beginning placidly, the non-chant-bearing voices soon release their latent energy in brilliant arabesques that propel the music into glorious climaxes before launching it into still greater activity in the faster-moving closing passages. But to grasp the substance of this motet, I think, is still to wonder at its sum. It's clear that it's a direct response musically to the words it says, drawn from the so-called Athanasian Creed. And I'm going to read you just the opening of that text. There are three matters of faith firmly to be believed that cannot be understood, but nevertheless are made credible by their author. But the immensity of God surpasses all things visible. Listening to this extraordinary piece, we're surely tempted to ask if the music itself isn't capable of wordlessly taking the three incomprehensibles of the Catholic Church alluded to in the text and raising them to some superior kind of understanding.
sense there of the fantastic gear changes in that piece, and it really seems to kind of shift completely at certain points and change direction and you know, move in a completely different way. And there's the energy that builds up to those uh, transitions that's really incredibly powerful. I think maybe some of you might have, maybe some of you buy a lot of CDs might have spotted the voice in there, the lovely tenor voice of James Gilchrist, who's uh, gone on to do a lot of solo performing, a lot of leader and uh, so on, his loss. Uh, it was a great time in Wally, while he was so uh, on his way up at least anyway. Very musical guy. Now of course music, however direct and impressive on its own terms, can never exist in isolation from the culture whose needs it serves. And such needs were probably never more profoundly felt than in the later Middle Ages. One of my preoccupations in recent years, often in collaboration with my colleague Philip Weller from the University of Nottingham, has been to present sacred music of the era in the context of the objects and spaces um, with which it interacted, vitalized by the presence of devotional works of music, venerated objects in wood, alabaster, paint, stained glass, became catalysts of engagement with, others, with the other senses. This multimedia experience with all its component strands together conjured up a charge, charged exchange of plea and hope for heavenly intercession for the earthly souls whose investments, personal or corporate, had brought them into being. Some of you here tonight were present in this hall a couple of years ago when, with the aid of the Bachelor Consult and projected images, we presented something of that interaction, that synergy, in the context of music and alabaster images dedicated to various saints. What I'm going to briefly discuss today, though, is a similar project that Philip and I have been engaged on in recent years, involving the so-called Bulletin Antiphonal and the today little-known Saint John of Bridlington, who died in 1379 and became, in 1401, the last Englishman to be canonized prior to the Reformation. And here's a little bit of that fantastic manuscript. Uh, this is a very rare survival of the late medieval illuminated liturgical book that's today preserved in Nottingham University Library, which recently brought it to the end of a painstaking decade-long um, restoration. The book was prepared in the early 15th century for the great Lancastrian magnate and veteran of Agincourt, Sir Thomas Chower. So it's not a surprise, really, to find in it a rhyme office for the famous uh, Lancastrian saint, John of Bridlington. This is the only complete copy of the office that includes music, and here's another page of the article. Oh, right. The bit that we're going to focus on is right here. This is part of the rhyme office, and it goes on several pages. I'm going to home in on this a little bit. And what you see right up at the top there is the words, Clem, the League of Spiritus. Um, there's a translation of what that means. I'm going to say a little bit about this, because um, that's one bit of the office that actually does survive elsewhere, and the only bit that does. And that's actually, um, that's what it would actually is, is a responsory. Um, and we find it a very long way away from the English Midlands, apart from this, in manuscripts in, of all places, Lucca and Trento in northeastern Italy, where the piece functions as the incorporated tenor of a polyphonic mass. And if you take a look at the tune up there, um, you can see Quer Mali, Quer Mali, Spiritus. I'm actually putting the wrong words to it, but never mind. Here it is again. Um, this is a page from the Look of Choir book, a rather dirty looking copy, but it's actually fairly dirty to begin with because the pieces of this choir book were dismembered and stuffed into the bindings of other books later on. That's actually the reason for the survival of lots of music from this period. And there's a close-up of the same cue. Uh, I have to take my word for it, but the rest of it's the same, but it is. So, you'll see there's something of a difference there, in that it's now mensurably laid down, so that the, um, the note values are actually set in a, a fixed rhythm, whereas in the chant, of course, there's no uh, indicators uh, menstrual uh, practice going on. Okay. Now these distant survivals in Italy, I think, tell us a lot about the cachet of English music of this period, which you both presumably 
to its sonic qualities, and also to the splendor of the English pageantry of which it formed a, a fragment. Although it was fashioned for particularly English ritual surroundings, interest in the music abroad was clearly such that great effort was expended both in acquiring it and in adapting it to local practices. Which is just as well for us, because otherwise it would be completely lost to history, because we were rather destructive with our manuscripts in this country. The ones that didn't end up in bindings and fragments were, they were destroyed, unfortunately. So there are very few complete English manuscripts of polyphony from the 15th century. So what this means in this instance is that the St. John melodies heard, sung mostly in long notes in the tenor voice, and you can see uh, that rhythmic size A I mentioned in the example here, in a series of linked settings of the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, and Agnus Dei, where it's dressed up in two other um, counterpointing voices. Borrowing melodies for this kind of reuse was standard practice at the time in polyphonic mass settings, and it's clear that the melody in question was always chosen for some emblematic purpose of the person or body who commissioned the mass. Given the elegant and sophisticated nature of this setting, uh, which, like the Lanchette I just played, you survives without an inscription, it's clear that it was composed for a richly endowed choir, and certainly for, for somebody with Lancastrian sympathies, if not indeed directly for a member of the Lancastrian royal house. <coughs> Wherever else it was performed in the 15th century, though, it seems very likely that at least at some point it resounded through the cavernous space of Brilliant Priory, the site of the saint's shrine and an important Lancastrian place of pilgrimage. This was all a fantastic discovery for me, for whom Bridlington really meant donkey rides and sticks of rock until I discovered this. That's John of Bridlington. About a month ago, we were privileged to be able to see Mass actually in this space, and here it is. See how magnificent it still is, even though the east end was chopped off. So the whole original choir went, and, and there was a, a, a new wall put in into what was at that time part of the name. It's still enormous but it was really quite, quite gigantic and palatial at the time. And so we, we performed this, um, this mass in this building, along with some of the items from the chant office, in a concert that, together with the symposium, marked the Priory's 900th anniversary. I'm going to play you part of the recording of the mass that we made several years ago, and you're going to hear two sections of the sanctus, the point in the polyphony that marks the focal point of the Mass in the transubstantiation and elevation of the host.
its attraction as a venue for research, I've always felt strongly that unfamiliar musics and unfamiliar performing styles have vital roles to play in teaching. While students can, and doubtless will, go away and carry on performing Beethoven V and Handel's Messiah for the rest of their lives, an important role for us in the academy is to broaden their musical outlook and give them a curiosity for the unfamiliar that can enrich their lives, and one hopes, also the broader musical landscape. One of the principal ways I put that into practice in my last job at Rutgers University was through a Baroque classical orchestra that I called Musica Raritana, after the Raritan River that ran through town. Because the ensemble functioned mainly for postgraduate performance students of a very high calibre, I was able to run it in short, sharp blasts and still get impressive results. So for a week or so each semester, I'd bring in professional coaches from New York City to work with them on period-style play in the context of some historically-based project or other. I'm going to talk a little bit about the last of the projects that I did, partly because it has, I was chosen very much with a mind to my move here and to a continuation in the Barber Opera. Handel's opera, Alcina, has been a staple of the modern repertory since its London revival in 1947 and its famous championing by James Sutherland. Much less familiar than is the opera that was playing around the same time as its premiere in 1735 at the rival London Opera Company, the Opera of the Nobility, and that was Nicola Porpora's Polyphemal. What we did in this program was to pit a first half of music by Porpora against a second of excerpts from Alcina. Besides introducing Porpora's thrilling music to an unsuspecting crowd, this also functioned to cast a completely new light on Alcina. London in the mid-1730s must have been a really pretty heady time for opera, and one that, in its showiness and overt virtuosity, was worlds away from the 15th century musical world I've been talking about up to now. In these glittering surroundings, some of the most brilliant composers and singers of the age vied for public attention. While competition drove more than a little conflict and even and skullduggery, I think it's fair to say that it also created an atmosphere in which musicians already endowed with prodigious talent could be driven to raise their game to even dizzier heights of compositional and vocal brilliance. Through Handel's works, we know about one side of that competition, but to hear that in the context of this also brilliant competition was exhilarating for all of us, and perhaps especially so for the two students and one professional singers who'd had a crack at filling the shoes of the original star performers. While the names of those 18th century performers are still familiar today, the superstar of the firmament was unquestionably the great Carlo Broschi, better known by his sobriquet Farinello. The season, 1734-5, saw the apogee of the rivalry between the two composing heavyweights, whose operas were first performed within just two months of one with Farinelli in his London debut as Acci, Francesca Cuzzoni as Galatea, and Antonio Montagnana in the title role, uh, Polyphema, which is based on the same plot from Ovid as Handel's Aces and Galatea, must truly have been a sensation. And it came very much at Handel's expense, since Porpora had snagged both Cuzzoni and Montagnana from, the rivals, from his rival's troop, the latter even breaking his contract with Handel in the process. It's probably unsurprising that Porpora rose to some of his greatest heights in composing for Farinelli. And similarly unsurprising that Farinelli's arias in Polyphemal are the only ones that have remained, retained any familiarity since, albeit to a pretty select audience. Farinelli's legendary status has, of course, far outlived the relatively short duration of his career. So much so, in fact, that only about seven years ago, his body was dug up in the interest of an attempt to understand how his physique may have been capable of producing these extraordinary vocal feats. By far the most celebrated of the many thousands of young men unmanned, as the euphemism goes, in the quest after the extraordinary beauty and power of the male soprano voice, Farinelli was noted for the amazing virtuosity which, over an incredible range of more than three octaves, and he achieved at the height of his powers. 
He was capable, of, apparently, of negotiating the most dizzying runs and vertiginous leaps at a pace that left his audiences gasping for breath. Yet that kind of glitter was only one side of his musical armory. His sense of musical line and his ravishing tone seems to have set him entirely apart from would-be rivals. And for that aspect of his artistry, he may have been indebted to the Emperor Charles VI, showing unusual musical perceptiveness, especially for a royal. The Emperor is said to have advised him that those gigantic leaps, those never-ending notes and passages, only surprise, and now's the time for you to please. If you wish to reach the heart, you must take a more plain and simple road. Now, such a road has traveled with unbelievable beauty in corporate's Alta Jorge, which I'm going to play you an excerpt from now. And you're going to hear this as sung in the concert that I conducted by my colleague from a bachelor concert, Mark Chambers, on whom I can assure you no surgery was necessary. <laughs> the incantatory text is important to an understanding of the ethereal beauty of the setting. Great Jove, your grace, your glory, are the great gift of immortal life that your sovereign gesture bestows on me. The scenes magically set by Farinelli's opening messa di voce, a long-held crescendo diminuendo effect that was one of his signatures on a single note that he could reputedly sustain for a, over a minute. This was said to be an especially effective tool in Farinelli's kit, and if any of you have seen that cheesy movie on Farinelli, it's the one that actually leads one of the powdered ladies to swoon and faint. Here then is the da capo section, the return section of Porporus Alto Giorgio.
sensational piece. I suggested a little while ago that certain repertories have fared rather better when transposed to modern instruments than others. One program of pieces that in my experience benefited particularly and illuminatingly from a period sensitive approach involved early works of Felix Mendelssohn. This was a program I mounted with the Musica Raritana and the German forty pianist Christoph Hammer. Having worked on it for a week and performed it in concert, we went on to record it professionally on a disc that's due to come out at some point on Naxos. The two pieces on the recording were the early A minor piano concerto, written in 1822, when Mendelssohn was 13, and the piano quartet that was written at 15, real veteran by then, a year before he the much more famous octet, which it foreshadows in a number of ways. Although both of these pieces have been performed and recorded a number of times since their revival in the latter half of the 20th century, as far as I knew, no attempts have been made to present either of them in a manner attentive to the performance practice of their own time. Now, attempting this involved a two-pronged approach. First, sourcing an appropriate piano, and second, researching into contemporary string style, in which I got some invaluable advice from Professor Clive Brown, an expert on late 18th, early 19th century string style at Leeds. Most obvious of all, of course, is the choice of instruments, and we used a replica of an 1815 six-octave Streicher grand piano. I was lucky to be able to find that, because it was very close to the piano, which still exists, that Mendelssohn played for two weeks in November 1821, while he was living in Goethe's house in Weimar, and then performing there to assemble dignitaries. We also followed Mendelssohn's own practice in using the piano not only for the solo part, but also to add continual realization in the concerto footies. The orchestral musicians played on gut strings with the modern taut style bows that were already generally current at the time these pieces were composed, but using them in a manner attentive to what we can surmise about that of Mendelssohn's early working environment. Actually, there's a good deal to go on there, or a good deal more than you might expect. Mendelssohn's violin teacher, Edouard Ries, was a pupil of the great violin pedagogue, Pierre Rode, an important figure in the celebrated and well-documented Paris School of Violin Playing in the early 19th century. That school was noted for its cantable style and for an approach to bowing that largely avoided pronouncing spiccato bow strokes being popularized around the same time by Paganini. Although the taut bow um, was naturally suited to techniques of that nature, as its subsequent history, history has obviously shown, it remained for much of its early life, especially in tutti playing, resolutely on the string, and especially in the fast passage work, in its upper half, something we'd be um, excoriating students in the orchestra for today as they concentrate on the upper half. And fascinatingly, I think, really, we can learn a lot about string phrasing, and by analogy, quite a bit also about musical phrasing more generally, especially in the voice, by studying bowings in this music. By modern standards, single bow strokes are extremely slow and extended, something that jives very closely with the extended songs without words phrasing that's so characteristic of Mendelssohn. As I play you a couple of examples, you'll also notice that much, there's much more sparing use than we used to today of vibrato, a technique that, until the early 20th century, in fact, quite a good way into the 20th century, generally occupied a role as only one of a battery of techniques of ornamentation rather than, as today, a more or less continuous colouring of the tone. Also characteristic of the time and of the recording we made is a sparing use of glissando slides and subtle tempo shifts which add greatly to the effective quality of this still wonderfully fresh and crystalline music. I'm going to play you two short excerpts. First, a taste of the slow movement of the concerto. You'll hear the midpoint moment when the mood shifts abruptly from an on over the opening song, the muted strings, into a B minor middle section with dramatic tremolos, bass pizzicati, and undulating mini sets, with all the elements highlighted in lucid detail by the gut strings and period keyboard. Then to follow that, the final passages of the already much riper Mendelssohn of the quintet. 
here I'm going to play the stormy return of the scherzo and the concluding helter-skelter stretcher transformation of the opening theme of the finale in D minor. And here again, the bright sounds of the instruments bring out the exhilaration of the music in a way that I think would be difficult, if not impossible, to achieve with the thicker tonal characteristics of the modern counterparts. <coughs>
characteristic of my last example, but here they're achieved in a very different way. While Mendelssohn was able to draw out the sense of line by a seemingly endless bowstring, the still little known English composer Cyril Scott creates a special kind of continuity by constant shifts in metrical indications. Clearly, the aim was to achieve a loose, metrically unconstrained sense of time and phrasing, and that certainly gives it a beguiling quality. But given the notational complexities that result, that's something that, as a player, you have to work pretty hard at to make feel intuitive. I alluded to the beginning of my talk to musics that have been submerged from public view by changes in fashion. That's nowhere truer than for the music of Scott. In the pre-World War I period, he enjoyed a lofty reputation internationally, with no less of a figure than Debussy calling him one of the rarest artists of the present generation. He was seen as an enfant terrible of the English musical scene, and was a formidable pianist, and was admired by many of the composing and conducting luminaries of the day. He was also a true Renaissance man. In the course of his long life, he published five volumes of poetry and about 40 books on topics as diverse as ethics, alternative medicine, and the occult. My interest in him came about as a result of a concatenation of circumstances that illustrates the best of what a university musical life can offer. I got to know of Scott's music from a pianist friend and collaborator who recorded his second piano sonata. But when I, it was when I invited that friend, excuse me, American pianist Clipper Erickson, to campus to give concerts in a master class that the pieces of my engagement with Scott came together. My colleague Ben Earle, who's interested in British modernism, in which Arena Scott's an important player, asked me if we could play the first version of the first violin sonata, a piece he was encouraging his postgraduate student, Peter Atkinson, to take on as a research project. Since then, we've performed the piece five times and have been in regular dialogue with Scott's son, Desmond, who's alive and emailing, aged 86, from his home in Toronto. Our connection with Desmond got a boost when we sent him a recording of a concert performance we gave in the first sonata and learned from him that, although there's a recording of a revision of the sonata from 1956, ours were probably the first performances of the first version since its premiere in 1908. Scott's music has seen a minor revival over the last decade or so, but there's still quite a lot that's never been performed at all, especially for his later years, uh, when he continued undeterred to compose in the face of total indifference from the musical establishment. We decided to record the first version of the sonata, coupled at Desmond's suggestion with Scott's last work for violin, the fourth sonata of 1956 a piece that was completely unperformed until two concerts we gave in the States about a month ago, when we also made the recording. The takes from the recording sessions are still being edited, and the disc should, I hope, be out next year. I'm going to end by playing you two excerpts from the first sonata, since first and foremost, what I'd like to resound with you as you leave this evening is the actual sounds of what I've been discussing. But before I do, I'm going to return to where I started and say just a little bit about why I attach some importance to what I've been talking about, especially in a university context. Clearly, I have an agenda here, and it's one that I've been upfront about since I came to this institution, and that's to bring performance right to the centre of university experience and, importantly, university research. I hope we all agree that, even these days, an object of teaching and research is to stir the imagination and, in historical studies, to evoke something of the essence of a social or cultural milieu. And the key word here is evocation. Music can invoke history with an intensity that words, and arguably no other medium, can. It can seize our imagination, sometimes even against our will, and place before us an extended experiential moment. And as we immerse ourselves in that moment, it can open up a portal to a different world, yet one with endless potential to enrich our own. Sometimes that can be a world that's been all but lost, like the world of Scott's first violin sonata, a quirky yet absorbing corner of that pre-lapsarian cultural flowering before the First World War, so wonderfully evoked, this time in words, by Leonard Wolfe. Certainly, as Desmond Scott pointed out to me, there's a world of difference between the two versions of the first sonata, 
separated as they are by 50 years, vast stylistic sea changes, and not one, but two world wars. Besides shedding about 15 minutes of music, the later version lost the rhapsodic sweep of the early one, including, including a huge, manic piano cadenza near the end of its finale. The core of the sonata, though, is the remarkable stillness of the slow movement that seems almost to emerge from opium-induced haze. I'm going to play you a section of this, followed by the climactic passage of the first movement, both from a live performance we gave in Philadelphia in April. Well, this last section is, I think, a swift burnout of the energy that was pent up by the previous 10-minute rumination that, that, uh, that um, leads to it on themes that are to reach an apotheosis more than half an hour later at the end of the finale. And as such, I think, it also forms a fitting drive to the cadence for my lecture this evening.
Thank you, Andrew, um, one more time. 